وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول Now inshallah ta'ala we're going to go into the 13th uh, way that the Salaf rahimahumullah used to worship Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and how they were amazing in, in doing so. And this is وَفِي مَجَالِ فِتْنَةِ nisa When it came to the trials and tribulations regarding women. The Salaf rahimahumullah, they stayed away from women. They avoided the opposite gender. It was mentioned that Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab, by the way, they say he was the most knowledgeable tabi'i. That there was no tabi'i more knowledgeable than him. And uh, scholars of hadith have actually been discussing whether the mursal and the marasil of Sa'id is actually acceptable. And he's got that level of the hadith that Sa'id ibn Musayyab attributes to the Prophet وسلم, without mentioning who he took from. Are they actually uh, maqbool? Is it accepted or not? That, that, that's a dialogue and a discussion going on between the scholars of hadith. And the reason is because he is that caliber and that level for people to discuss his narrations. Rahimahullah ta'ala. He said something very powerful, Sa'id. He said, مَا يَئِسَ الشَّيْطَانُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Shaytan never gives up on something. Like whoever, Shaytan wants to misguide. He looks at a person, Shaytan wants to misguide this person. He wants to bring this destruction to this person. He wants to throw them into misguidance. He wants to bring turmoil to, the, turmoil to this person. Shaytan if he can't get through to this person, he will, he, will, he will try his best to use this method, which is He'll come to him from the way of the women. He'll try this way, he tries, it doesn't work. He knows if he tries a woman, he'll get to you. And that's something shaytan uses. Sa'id al-Musayyab saying, مَا يَئِسَ الشَّيْطَانُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا أَتَاهُ مِنْ قِبَلِ النِّسَاءِ The shaytan does not give up on something except that he comes to the people from the uh, uh, women. He also said about himself, and Sa'id Musayyib, he reached age 84, became very old. And there was actually a time in the city of Medina, pay attention to this, uh, city of Medina, no one would give fatwa except Sa'id Musayyib. He reached that level. And we know Medina was where the Prophet died. <laughs> And this is the time of the Tabi'een. Ponder on this. No one can give fatwa. Everyone's going to Sa'id. And he reached that level. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'ah. He, and he reached the age of 84. He said, after reaching that age, and he didn't just reach that age. He was 84. One of his eyes was gone. And he wasn't, couldn't walk properly. He said to his students one day, he said to some of his students, There is nothing I fear the most than women. 84 years of age. One eye is missing. He's very fragile. He's saying to his students, There is nothing I fear more than women. There is nothing more fearful to me than women. So this is what they were. And I want to stress on this point uh, greatly at this particular time that many people are isolated in their houses and they, are at, and they are at home. A lot of the times people forget the concept of uh, segregation and staying away from one another. A lot of the times people, they get too close. They uh, do things which later re reach a very bad road. It comes to a very bad road. Or it becomes a very bad result. Lidalika, Ibn al-Qayyim wrote a kitab called Turuq al-Hukmiya fi siyasat al-Shari'ah. Where he talks about Islamic politics. What does Islamic politics mean? And what's very fascinating in that book is that Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned one of the reasons why pandemics happen. Yani he said that, rahimahullah. One of the reasons that bring viruses, one of the reasons that bring, bring calamities, he says, 
and the fall of governments and systems is free mixing. It's free mixing. And if I was to remember to bring it, I would have read it on you all right now. Go to the Kitab Turuq al Hukumiya fi Siyasat al Shari'a by Ibn al Qayyim and you'll see that which I said there. He mentions that. He says that countries and systems and governments fall and pandemics, plagues, he mentions, illnesses and viruses, they spread because of free mixing. So I really want us to, inshallah ta'ala, know and understand that we want Allah to lift this um, uh, virus from us, the coronavirus. And it's not the right time for us to fall into muharramat and things that Allah ta'ala prohibited. ولذلك, the statement of Ibn Qayyim is actually taken from a hadith of the Prophet The Prophet said to the Sahaba, يا معشر المهاجرين خمس خصال إذا بتليتم بهن وعوذ بالله أن تدركوهن أنصار uh, sorry مهاجرين the Prophet said five things if you are tested with and I seek refuge in Allah from these five لم تظهر الفاحشة في قوم زنا does not spread in a people and going against Allah تبارك وتعالى's religion by free mixing and being with the opposite gender and doing haram with them there is not a people that fahisha, sinning and crimes does not become pre prevalent amongst them except that Allah brings what? Illnesses, plagues, viruses that were not present in the previous nations. The Prophet said that alayhi salatu wasalam. Hadith Ibn Umar, which is narrated in Sunan Tirmidhi. So, women is something we need to abstain from, the opposite gender. And the men, the women have to be careful from them as well and not go, get too close to them. And now that a lot of the family members might be in the same house, there might be an odd cousin over here, there might be a family friend who's here who's staying in the house because he cannot leave the country and etc. Remember this. Fitnatun Nisa. Number 14, inshallah ta'ala, is Majalu birril walidain. Being obedient towards your parents. And how the Salaf were when it came to this ibadah. How they enjoyed it. Obedient towards your parents. Muhammad ibn Sirin, he said, uh, it was said about him. Kana Muhammad ibn Sirin, ida kallama um ummahu. That Sa'id, sorry, Muhammad ibn Sirin. He was also a tabi'i. It was said about him, ida kallama ummahu. If he spoke to his mother. لا يكلمها بلسانه كله. He wouldn't use his entire tongue. يعني he would watch what he would say. He would think about his words. He would choose his words. He would protect his tongue from what comes out of it. إجلال لها. And he would do all of that in honor and veneration of his mother. Rather, بعض السلف, some of the salaf, they considered حد البصر إلى الوالدين العقوق. They considered Looking at your parents like that, just focusing on them and looking at them and gazing at them, they consider that to be what? Disobedience. Okay? Looking at your mother, looking at your father. They believed, look down. Don't look at your parents. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he saw a man. Ra'a rajulan yatufu bi ummihi. A man that was doing tawaf around the Kaaba with his mother. وَقَدْ حَمَلَهَا and he carried her عَلَىٰ عَاتِقِهِ he carried her on his shoulders فَقَالَ the man said to Ibn Umar he's looking at Ibn Umar he's got his mother with, me, with him he said أَتَرَانِي جَزَيْتُهَا have I fulfilled her rights have I done what was upon me have I fulfilled my mother's obedience have I done what was upon me قَالَ he said to him in response he said, لا. فقال ابن عمر, لا. ولا بزفرة واحدة. What you've just done is not even equal to the exhaling, um, the uh, push from the pushes that she did when she was giving birth to you. Not one push. Not even equal to that. This man's carrying his mother on his shoulders. He's doing the offer on the Kaaba. And Abdullah ibn Umar is saying, it's not even equivalent to the push or a push from the pushes that she pushed uh, when she was giving birth to you. Number 15, the 15th 
uh, act of ibadah and obedience that the Salaf rahimahumullah used to come with, which is tarhu uh, al-ghibah. The Salaf rahimahumullah, they abstained and they stayed away from backbiting. And they would make sure that they didn't backbite. And backbiting is dhikruka aqaka bima yakrah. It is to say about your brother or your sister what he or she does not like. The Salaf rahimahumullah, they used to leave that. And they never used to back by anyone. They abstain from that. Uh, Hassan al-Basri, he said, Wallahi, by Allah, Hassan al-Basri is saying, by Allah, ghiba is asra'u fasadan fi deen al-abdi min al-akalati fil jasadi. That backbiting is more severe for the body than cancer is for the body. The way that cancer uh, can kill the person. The uh, the uh, backbiting is worse. And he also said, "إذا رأيت الرجل يشتغل بعيوب غيره," if you ever see a person who is preoccupied with the faults and the mistakes of other people, ويترك عيوب نفسه, and he leaves off the mistakes that are present in himself, فعلم أنه قد مكر به. Then know that this person is a deceived individual. And Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, and an Imam al-Bukhari, by the way, his science that he de dealt with in Islam, his subject, his field, was ilm al-hadith, the science of hadith. And in ilm al-hadith, there is an amount of backbiting that is needed. Naam. There's an amount that's needed. And which is to speak about the narrators and criticize them and mention what their faults and mistakes are. So the whole science that he deals with has a whole area called Ilm al wa Ta'adil, the chapter uh, of uh, the men, the narrators, and their, their status, whether the hadith can be accepted from them or not. So Bukhar, this is what he deals with. He said about himself, uh, I never backbited anyone. When I, when I studied and I learned, uh, that the backbiting will harm the people. When I learned the harm that backbiting has and the sin regarding the backbiting and how harmful it is, I never backbited anyone. He also said, Rahimahullah, about himself, Al Imam al Bukhari, Arju an alqallaha wa la yuhasibuni an nighta tabtu. I hope that I meet Allah tabarak wa ta'ala yawm al qiyamah and I have not backbited anyone. Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahimahumullah and others they said the same thing. It was said the same about him. وَلِذَلِكَ يَحْيَى بْنُ مَعِينٍ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ One day cried. And they said, why are you crying for? And then he said, where am I going to be? يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ About the people I spoke about. يَحْيَى بْنُ مَعِينٍ يَعْنِي رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ Imam al-Jarhu al-Ta'adil who had to criticize the narrators. He was scared about what he said about the narrators which he was uh, needed and it was required from him to criticize the narrators in order for the hadiths to be protected for us. Ma'adalik, he was scared. So stay away from backbiting. Again, isolation necessitates um, family gatherings and discussions and talks and things to speak about and وَمَا إِلَىٰ ذلك, And one thing leads to another and then backbiting comes out of nowhere. And people start slandering other people they carry on stories regarding one another. So it's something we should avoid. Now, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to move on to the 16th, bi-idhnillah al kareem act of obedience, uh, act of worship that the Salaf rahimahumullah used to do, which is al-bu'du um, anil mutashabih. To abstain from doubtful things, yani things which are unclear to you. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he said, لأن أرد درهما من شبهة أحب إلي من أن أتصدق بستمائة ألف. عبد الله مبارك إنه قال: for me to reject a dirham and this dirham there's shak in it. for me to reject one dirham that I have a doubt where it came from is more beloved to me than to give صدقة of what six hundred thousand dinar. 600,000 dinar of money for me to give that out. I 
what's more beloved to me is to reject one dinar, I'm a one dirham of doubt. This is very powerful. This is an extremely powerful point, which is to withhold from the evil takes precedence than what? Thinking about good, bringing good. Yani, for me to protect myself from the haram takes precedence of me thinking about doing good and bringing about good by giving sadaqah. And I want to mention something here. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he, who, is, who is his father? Abdullah ibn Mubarak, who is his father? His father, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, is Al Mubarak uh, ibn Warraq al Hanbali. That's his father's name. And it was said about his father, Abdullah ibn Mubarak's father, he was a slave for a master. He, was, he had a master and he was a slave. His father one day was uh, some, uh, the master, sorry, the master requested from Al Mubarak, the father of Abdullah. He requested from him to go get from the garden a, a juicy fruit. So go go to the garden and bring from there a, a juicy fruit. So Al Mubarak went in and when he went, he brought a fruit. He gave it to the master and the master bit the fruit. And then he said to him, did I not tell you to get me a juicy fruit? A tasty fruit? What you got me isn't. Mubarak responded quickly and fast. And he said to him, I've been working in your garden for that long. I've never ever eaten anything in the garden. So I wouldn't know how it tastes. He was taken back. How is that possible? Fruits fall off trees. You don't ever pick it up and eat it? No, never. It's not mine to eat. From that day, Al Mubarak became someone special to the master. And the master married his daughter off to him. And from there came Abdullah al Mubarak. Halal. What he ate. And so his son became Abdullah al Mubarak. Abdullah al Mubarak was said he was so rich that he used to come to the city and the town and he would say to the people, All of you guys, your hajj is upon me this year. And it was said that he was so wealthy and so rich, one year he would do hajj and one year he would go to the jihad. Money. Rahimahullah ta'ala. So he used to say for me to reject one dirham, which I have a doubt about, is more beloved to me than thinking about giving in sadaqah 600,000. Dinar, I hope, is what he meant by it. And if not, then maybe dirham. The 18th, inshallah, sorry, the 17th uh, point is ما يتعلق بالتعليم والفتية Regarding teaching and giving fatwa The Salaf rahimahumullah They were very Very cautious of what they taught They didn't just um, Jump on teaching They were very cautious in teaching They were also considerate of um, Their own ability They knew what they were like They knew their own ability What they understood What they didn't so if they didn't know something, they would say, I don't know. And if they knew they were not fit for something, they wouldn't take it on. And Imam Malik, rahimahullah, look what he said. مَا يَنْبَغِي لِلْرَجُلِ And Imam Malik said, it is not permissible for a man أَنْ يَرَى نَفْسَهُ أَهْلًا لِشَيْءٍ حَتَّى يَسْأَلَ مَنْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ مِنْهُ It is not permissible for a person to see himself as something, to see himself as fit to give fatwa or to teach, Unless he asks those who are more knowledgeable than him. Unless he asks the ulama and the people of knowledge, can I teach? Am I fit to teach? Am I fit to uh, go through this? Unless he does that, he shouldn't teach. You find them scared when they were asked questions. And used to think about it. And Imam Malik himself said that whoever is, who, anyone who's asked a question, he should place himself between Jannah and Nar. And you think about Jannah and Nar when you, before you answer that question. Is that answer you're going to give you, take you to Jannah, or is it going to take you to the hellfire? Because they knew that whatever they say, they are speaking on behalf of Allah Azza wa And they do not want to lie about Allah. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَا تَصِفُ أَلْسِنَتُكُمُ الْكَذِبِ هَذَا حَلَالٌ وَهَذَا حَرَامٌ لِتَفْتَرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَفْتَرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ لَا يفلحون. Don't say this is halal and haram and you have no knowledge of it. You don't understand the matter. You have no detailed understanding of it. Don't just say that. What do you do? Say, la adri. 
I don't know. ولذلك والذا poet صاحب المراقي ودري سي والكل من أهل المناحي الأربعة يقول لا أدري فكل متبعة. All the imams they all used to say I don't know. So be a person who follows them. If you're a Hanafi in Madhab, then follow your Imam who you said لا أدري when he never when he didn't know the answer of a question. If you are a Maliki and you follow Imam Malik, then follow him in this. When you don't know anything, just say لا أدري I don't know. If you're a Shafi'i, then follow Imam Shafi'i in this and say I don't know. And if you're a Hanbali, follow Imam Ahmad in this issue by saying لا أدري I don't know when you don't know a matter. So these scholars, they had taqwa and piety of Allah. And whenever they were asked, they said, I don't know. And if they didn't have the understanding of issues in the religion, they took it to, who, they took it to whoever they knew was fit to answer it. And sometimes within themselves, they will say, go to so-and-so and ask him. He, he knows it. Within themselves, the imams would do this. They wouldn't speak about everything. Rahimahumullah. وَلَيْسَ فِي فَتْوَاهُ مُفْتٍ مُتَّبَعَ مَا لَمْ يُضِفْ لِلْعِلْمِ وَالدِّينِ الْوَرَعَ When a person who's given a fatwa and wants to speak on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has to have knowledge and piety. And he has to be a person who fears Allah قَلْبًا وَقَالِبًا Externally and internally. And he also has to be a person who has knowledge of these issues that he's speaking about. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.